After watching this video, you will learn how to create OCR that detects character while typing. We will start by implementing dense neural network with backpropagation algorithm to train it. Then we put this network to work, accurately identify characters. To make it interactive, we will also create a simple window where you can draw characters, instantly connecting your input to OCR for real-time recognition. First, let's break it down how the network will process input and generate output. We will start by examining a simple image of digit 2. This image has a resolution of 8x8 pixels. We can convert it into an 8x8 matrix, where the background pixels are represented by zeros, and the foreground, the digit itself, is represented by ones. Next, we will flatten this matrix into one dimension array of size 64, by taking each row and placing it sequentially in the array. Each element of this array becomes an individual input to our neural network. For simplicity, we will limit this network to detect only digits. This means we will need only 10 output neurons, one for each digit. In this case, if the third neuron output is 1, it indicates that the network has predicted that the digit in the image is 2, because we can't think from 0. We'll be implementing a neural network from scratch, focusing on matrix operation for efficiency computation. Before we dive into the math, I recommend checking out my previous videos where I provide an overview of how neural networks work and how we train them. This video are offering a good foundation that will make it easier to follow the mathematical concepts we will be covering here. For our example, we will work with a simple network, three input nodes, one hidden layer with five neuron and one output layer. To compute the output of the network, we proceed layer by layer, starting from the input layer and moving forward to the output layer. This is necessary because each layer output serves as the input for the next layer. For each neuron, we calculate a weighted sum of input. We then apply the activation function to this sum to determine the neuron's final output. This process is repeated for every neuron in the current layer. It is important to note that while all neurons in the same layer receive the same input, what differentiates them are their respective weights. Once all neurons in a layer have been proceeded, we move to the next layer, repeating the same steps. This time we use the output of the previous layer as the input for the current one, along with a new set of weights. The orange number in the formula highlights what changed between layers, particularly the weights. This shows how the calculations from the first layer are unwrapped. The only variation between formulas for each neuron is the set of weight assigned to it. This process can be simplified using a dot product between two vectors. Dot product involve multiplication corresponding element from two vectors with the same index and summing the results. To streamline this further, we can express the operation as matrix multiplication. By definition, when we multiply two matrix, each element in the resulting matrix is a dot product of a row from the first matrix and a column from the second. In this example, to calculate output matrix, we need to multiply a single row of n matrix by each column of the weight matrix, which is exactly what matrix multiplication is. So in essence, the forward pass for each layer is just matrix multiplication between input and weight, followed by application the activation function to each output value. We can break down the forward pass into the following steps. On the left, we have our input vector. At the top, we see our weight matrix. The s value represents the output from the multiplication. As mentioned earlier, we can calculate the s-value by multiplying the input vector n row with each column of the weight matrix. Next, we apply the activation function to each s-element. We repeat this process for the next layer. On this image, we see the whole flow of the neural network calculation. Looks a bit like a waterfall. This leads us to general formula for calculating any neuron in the network. I stands for the layer number. J represents the neuron number within the layer. N with index i denotes the size of the layer. W with upper i index is the weighted matrix for this layer. This formula will help us to train network. Now that we understand how to transfer input into output using matrix operation, we need to address a crucial step, training the network. Without training, our network will produce random output values, so we need a way to adjust this output to be meaningful. The key to adjust the output lies in modifying the weight for each layer. But how exactly do we do that? We need to figure out how activation function change depend on received value. This is important because this will tell us how to update weight. Let's have a look on a sample function to understand that. If we are in a blue position, to increase the function output, we should move to the left, so the function input should be smaller. On the other hand, when we are in the pink position, if we want to increase function output, we should move to the right, which means increasing function input value. To quantify how the function change, we calculate its derivative. The derivative gives us the slope of the tangent line at any point of the function. 
allowing us to understand how the function changes depending on the direction we move. Let's look at this animation to visualize the concept. The green line represents the function. The red square marks the current position of the function. The yellow line represents the tangent line, and its slope is the value of the function derived at that point. This tangent line provides the insight into how the function changes at the current position. Unfortunately, calculating the derivative for a neural network function is a bit more complex. Unlike simple functions where you have a direct input value, in neural network we use another function to compute the weighted sum of the input. This means we are dealing with the derivative of a composition of two different functions. Specifically, we need to differentiate the activation function with respect to the weighted sum, which itself is a function of the neural input and weights. This process involves using the chain rule from calculus, which allows us to differentiate composition functions. By applying the chain rule, we can find out how change in the weight affects the overall output of the network, guiding us in adjustment to the weight to improve the network performance. To calculate the derivative of the composition function, we need to find the derivative of f and g separately, and then multiply them together. Since we need to update each weight, we must compute the derivation of this function with respect to every weight in the network. These multidimensional derivatives are known as gradient. To be precise about which weight derivant we are calculating, we will introduce an additional index m. Let's look at an example with our neuron, the neuron n21. n21 depends on weights w11, w12, and w13. We need to calculate the derivative for each of these weights. The derivative of fx is straightforward, but what about the g function? Let's break it down. Everything that does not involve wgm is treated as constant. The derivative of a constant is zero, so we can drop these terms. We are left with only one value. This is simple derivative of a linear function, which is simply the coefficient a. In this case, it's the neural input for the particular weight. Now we can multiply the derivative value by the error to obtain the correction value, which will be used to adjust the weight. However, we don't want to make large abrupt changes to the weight. Instead, we aim to train the network gradually. To control the training speed, we introduce a learning rate, denoted as lambda. This learning rate scales the correction value. A large lambda value will speed up the weight update, but may reduce accuracy. A smaller lambda value results in more precise training, but the process will take longer. Usually we start with bigger lambda for faster training, and while we train our network, we'll make it smaller to increase model accuracy. There is one problem with our formula. We know the expected value for output layer, but what about the other layers? We can't directly calculate these errors, so we use a method called error backpropagation to estimate these errors. To estimate the error of each neuron, we take the error from the adjacent layer and compute the weighted sum using the weight connecting the input neuron to the output neurons. Again, we can wrap it into the dot product of error and weighted vector, just like we did with forward pass. There is one key difference from forward pass. We reverse the connection, so we have to use transposed weight matrix. We repeat this process to propagate the error backward through the network. Now we just substitute our actual error with the estimated values. We now have our update formula, so let's apply it to our example to see how it actually works in practice. The learning rate lambda remains constant through a single training epoch. Error and function derivative is constant for all weight of a single neuron. Neuron input value has the same index as neuron weight. Let's break that into a matrix operation. We take error vector and multiply it by scalar lambda value. Next, we calculate the Hadamard product with derivative vector. Hadamard products simply multiply values of two matrix that has the same index. This operation gives us the vector that we will use in the next step to adjust the weight. Last operation we need to perform is outer product. Outer product multiply every value from one vector with every value from second vector, resulting in a matrix. We then add this result matrix to our current weight matrix, updating the weight accordingly. The entire operation is performed for every layer in the network, ensuring that all weights are adjusted appropriately through the training process. Time to train our OCR. I decided to start with small characters. My target was 16 by 16 pixel per character. This way we have only 256 input and 10 output. We will also add two hidden layers, first one 64, second 32 neurons. This brings total of 18,000 weight, quite a lot. To generate data sets, I just opened GIMP, set layer size to 512 by 16, and I started writing zeros using draw table. Then I repeat this for one, two, and other digits. 
Finally, I created test data. This time I created layer 1024 by 16 and I draw digits in order, so from 0 to 9. Next, I wrote the code to load this image and extract the digits. Since each character had a different size, there was a challenge on how to map them onto a 16 by 16 image. My initial approach was to center each character digit onto a 16 by 16 canvas and see how it performed. I started training network using training data with a simple stream training approach. Stream training means I simply present character and immediately update weights accordingly. While this method is easier to implement, it's not the most effective for achieving optimal result. I then check how well my network recognized character from the test data. The epoch count indicates how many training iterations were complete through the entire training set. Each row in the result matrix shows the average output for a specific training character, giving us an idea on how well the network represented the training set. For example, the third row shows the average result when the network is presented with the number 2, since we are counting from 0. In ideal scenario, we will see an identity matrix, indicating perfect detection of every character. We can see that network performed well on training set. However, the lobby on the matrix, which show detected character on the test data alongside their expected value, reveals that the results are not as accurate as we would like. Under success by character, we can observe the network success rate in detecting each digit. For instance, the network only have 50% success rate in recognition the number one, and correctly identify the number three only one third of the time. On the other hand, it recognized the number zero correctly 85% of the time. Overall, the average success rate was 60%. Several factors could be contribute to this less than ideal performance, such as a small or inadequate training set, the network being overtrained, ineffective conversion of a character to the 16x16 16 16 format. My initial thought was to create larger digit image to capture more details per character, so I upgraded the image size from 16x16 16 16 to 32x32 32 32 pixels. With this change, the input vector size increased four times, growing from 256 to 1024 element. To accommodate this larger input, I also modified the hidden layers. Now we have three hidden layers, the first one with 256 neuron, the second one with 128 neuron, and the third one with 64 neurons. This new configuration results in over 300,000 weight to train, over 16 times the number of the weight we have with 16 by 16 image. Training the network with the larger 32 by 32 image took over 3 minutes, but the final results were still not perfect. The success rate improved to around 70% but I knew there was more room to improve. Next I focused on how I mapped the character onto the input. Initially I simply cut out the digit and centered them within the 32 by 32 image. However this approach could cause issues. Depending on the dimension of the number, it might activate completely different input neuron, leading into inconsistent indetection. To address this, I experienced with two different scaling techniques. Aspect ratio preservation. This technique scales the digit to fit the maximum possible space while preserving the original x to y ratio. Full stretch, this method scales the digit to fill the entire 32x32 32 32 space, this regret the original aspect ratio. Both techniques proved to be quite effective. Training with each of them took less than 90 seconds, and the success rate jumped to around 95%. I made one final improvement by thickening the line of the digit in the training image. This adjustment helped the network better recognize character that didn't match the training lines perfectly. After implementing this change, the success rate exceeds 97%. With this level of accuracy, the network was ready for live detection. Drawing Canvas I implement a simple window and add the mouse listener to enable drawing. When the user clicks the leftmost button, I store the mouse position as prev x and prev y. As the user moves the mouse, I check if the leftmost button is still pressed. If it is, I draw a line between the previous coordination, prev x and prev y, and the current mouse position. After drawing the line, I update prev x and prev y to the current mouse position. This way, as the user continues to move the mouse, it draws a continuous line. Now that we can draw character, we need to extract them for neural network. This task is straightforward since we have a clear distinction between the background and foreground color. Any pixel that is in background color is considered part of character. However, we also need to group this foreground pixel into separate digit. My approach assumes that all pixels belong to single digit should be connected. However, we also need to group these foreground pixels into separate digits. My approach assumes that the pixel belong to a single digit should be connected to one another. As long as two pixels are connected, they belong to the same group. To achieve this, I use a simple float fill algorithm. Here is how it works. I scan the image from the top left corner to the bottom right corner, looking for any pixel that is part of the foreground. 
when I find a foreground pixel, I start the float fill algorithm. This algorithm moves recursively to each adjacent pixel, checking if this also a part of the foreground. If it is, I expand the bounding box and continue the float fill in that direction. If an adjacent pixel is a background pixel, the algorithm moves back in the recursion. Once the float fill completes, I have a bounding box for a single digit. I then continue scanning the image for the next foreground pixel and repeat the float fill for each new group of connected pixels. Each pixel can be used only once, including those already covered by float fill. This ensures that the same character isn't detected multiple times from different starting points. Once we have a list of detected digits, I sort them in a standard writing order, top to bottom and left to right. I then display these sorted digits in the top row of the window. I scale each digit, send it to neuron network and below each digit I display the character that OCR has recognized. This is the result I got. Thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, please give a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any future updates. See you next time.